the rain isn't making any noise. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. We have two more of these, and I want to remind you before I introduce our speaker that um, the president of the university, uh, Father Quinn, is going to be speaking at 5.30 on um, next Thursday, a week from today, um, on, the on the 14th at 5.30 in De Naples, and I hope you can come to that and all the, the few programs that remain on, in this semester. It's a distinct pleasure for me to welcome back Mike Edwards to the Schemmel Forum. We are welcoming him back in one sense, but we are welcoming today the new Mike Edwards, for he is a living example of a work in progress. <laughs> on the one hand, he has eternally, is his, on the one hand, he's eternally committed to making the world a better place for all its people. On the other, he has used his remarkable skills and imagination in doing that in a number of venues, to name a few, Oxfam, the World Bank, the Ford Foundation, Demos, and in recent years, an historic house in a small community in the Catskill Mountains named Swan Lake. In the contemplative atmosphere of Swan Lake, Mike has come up with a radical idea that goes well beyond giving grants to nonprofit organizations and writing treatises on civil society. He is going for the gold, transformation. He's here to change our minds about the world and how we can improve it. It is with the big idea adding the dimension of love and spirituality to the quest for equality and justice. Mike has worked in every part of the world and influenced numerous prestigious organizations. He's a thinker and an activist who continues to bring fresh ideas and actions to the to ever-present, ever-growing challenges that face our increasingly interdependent world. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sandra. And thanks, Emily. We're of issues for helping to get me here. There she is in the back of the room. And thanks to all of you for coming out this glorious late summer weather here in the northeast. I can't actually tell you how, how nice it is to actually drive from your home to give a talk like this. Normally I'm on planes and trains and buses all over the place, getting to the place I'm speaking to, but here I can actually drive through beautiful countryside, both sides of the Delaware, just an hour and a half actually from Swan Lake, right here into Scranton. So thanks very much for inviting me back. It's a pleasure to be here. The last time I was here, some of you may remember, I was actually quite pessimistic quite downhearted about the decline of the civic spirit, civil society, community, solidarity, compassion um, in American society. That was the theme of my talk. So now I'm going to go to the opposite extreme today, and I'm going to speak with a huge amount of hope and optimism, although I hope not overly romantically, about the prospect that American society and other societies could actually be radically transformed in the image of love and justice, what Martin Luther King once called the beloved community, a community that was successful in economic and social and political terms, but also in spiritual and human terms, to bring the whole thing together. And when I say radical, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about radical left or radical light, right, conservative or liberal or democrat or republican. Uh, I'm trying to talk about things that I think at least cross all of those divisions, so I'm using radical in its root sense of boundary-breaking changes that go to the root of the problems that we face and challenge conventional thinking on both sides of the political aisle. Now, talking about transformation in that sense may strike you as an example of, of overreach, um, given the very concrete, immediate problems that we have, you have here in Scranton, for example, in, in fiscal terms. Why, why talk about transformation? when things have to be done tomorrow morning. But of course, that's precisely why you should talk about transformation, because otherwise you get locked in to horizons which are too small. Um, and I think transformation and talking about it is fully in line with America's own image of itself. I'm not American, but I've lived here happily now for 15 years and so. And I've always been impressed by that idea of the city on the hill, a society in constant search of greater perfection, however difficult that is, some sort of beacon, if you will, 
albeit one that maybe has dimmed a little in recent times, so much so that today it's actually very difficult, I think, to think in terms of radical change at all. So why is that? I think the answers are, are pretty clear because there's been a severe narrowing of our horizons in politics and economics and social activism, all of which now revolve around what is possible in the short to medium term, the political Washington cycle and so on, what's pragmatically achievable, um, in other words, without rocking the boat too much in the deeply fractured society in which we live. So it seems as though we have little room to manoeuvre, little flexibility. Um, we feel imprisoned almost in the structures and the systems that we've inherited. In politics, basically, the major parties cancel each other out most of the time. There's little long-term vision to excite the popular imagination across those political lines to actually bring people together in some sort of common cause. In economics, large businesses and banks, financial institutions, threaten to remove their investments and move job overseas as soon as anyone tries to reshape or regulate them in the public interest. There's that threat hanging over the transformation of the economy or simply move elsewhere. And even in the world of activism, where I guess I come from, um, the great social movements of the past are simply not here anymore. They're only increasingly distant memory from the 60s and the 70s. And they've been replaced by cyber warriors and internet activists and non-profit special interest groups, frankly, that no longer have much capacity to engage ordinary citizens in concerted action. And that's why um, broad citizen participation is declining um, right across the country. The result of that limiting of our horizons is gridlock or stasis, exemplified by the recent fiasco over the budget, the US debt limit, and so on. Um, that was an extreme example, if you like, of the problem that I'm talking about. But there's an underlying and broader spreading sense of disempowerment, a sense that only incremental change is possible around the margins of our institutions. The problem, though, is that those incremental changes, those small possible changes, don't actually affect what's happening to the great majority of the population. Regardless, and here's the crucial point, regardless of, who's, of which party is in power or how well the economy is doing. If you take statistics on inequality in wealth and income in the United States, for example, between 1947 and 1979, the bottom 95% of families in America received 80% of the growth in incomes that occurred during that period of broadly shared prosperity. Maybe you were lucky enough to grow up during that time. That was quite a significant, actually a very significant, social and economic achievement. Wealth was very broadly shared through the great body of the population. So there was a huge uplift effect, not universal, but very large. In the following 30 years, though, so that's between 1979 and 2007, that figure declined from 80% to 19% while the top 1% of households in America captured two-thirds of all the wealth that was created by the economy during that period. And that is the stark fact of the decline of the middle class and the rise of the super-rich, captured in that headline statistic. But things got even worse. More recently, between 2009 and 2011, that top 1% of American families captured all the growth in incomes that occurred during those three years. In fact, they captured 121% of it. Bit of a mathematical tease of that one. Um, but that's what the statistics say. That bottom 95%, which probably is where most of us uh, are, actually lost ground, not just in relative terms, but absolutely. So since the year 2000, the US economy has grown actually by almost 20%. That's pretty good. But medium household income has fallen by over 12 percentage points. So economic growth is going this way, and our incomes, in real terms, are going this way. And that curve, extrapolated back and forward, is only going in one direction. And unfortunately for most of us, it's downhill all the way. And we've had many different administrations and many different episodes of economic growth during those 50 years. But it hasn't affected that general trend towards rising inequality. And you can see that same pattern in other areas too environmental degradation and carbon emissions, for example, which are continually rising, whatever we do about them, uh, out of control military spending, which I'll come to later, and indicators of social decay and community cohesion. So the conclusion from those bald statistics, to me anyway, is pretty clear. Our attempts to solve the really big problems that we face are not working. 
regardless of who sits in the Oval Office or how well the economy is doing. That's the stark fact that we face. And if we continue in this way, if small change is all we seek, then small change is all we're going to get. We will not affect those fundamental trends. So we have to challenge ourselves to get our sights up, to raise our sights much higher if we want to break out of this pattern. We have to push, in other words, for transformation. So what do I mean by that word, transformation? I'm using it in two ways. The first, perhaps most obvious way, is that transformation signifies larger than usual, boundary-breaking, bold changes that release some of the constraints that prevent our current institutions from having much of an impact or realizing their potential in areas like inequality. So for example, instead of just focus on creating more jobs, which we do at the moment by and large, many of which we know will be low paid with few benefits involved in dirty or destructive industries, why don't we focus on creating an economy that delivers well-being and happiness for everyone? <clears throat> it's a much bigger goal. Or instead of focusing so much on protecting voting rights for individuals in an increasingly unresponsive political system, important though they are, I'm not against uh, protecting voting rights, believe me, why don't we focus on inventing new forms of politics and democracy that bring people together rather than forcing them apart? Again, it's a bigger goal. So that's the first characteristic, big boundary breaking ideas and solutions. The second characteristic, and probably the secret, I think, that makes something potentially powerful in this way, is that this kind of boundary-breaking change, and I'm going to give you some examples, um, both historically and today, does one very important but much neglected thing. And that is that it weaves together both personal change, on the one hand, and social change, on the other hand. In other words, changing ourselves and who we are and our behavior and our values on the inside, at the same time as inventing new laws and policies and institutions on the outside. Now, deep down, and call me romantic if you want, I'm convinced that we are all loving and compassionate people. That is our essence, that is our birthright. But the systems we've invented for producing goods and services or making political decisions or even fighting for our rights or organizing ourselves in economic and political terms when you think about them, tend to run on precisely the opposite set of values and motivations. Greed, violence, domination, self-interest, short-termism, and so on. So we have this curious paradox of human beings who are trying to be um, as loving and compassionate and, if you like, perfect in the spiritual sense as they can be, and, and the institutions we create to run things which run on the opposite kind of chemistry. And there's an obvious contradiction there. So what transformation does, it says, well, let's remove that contradiction by bringing those two things together and uniting them so we can have both personal and social change interwoven together. Because you can have all the new policies and as much money as you like, right? But there will be no end to patriarchy without deep-rooted changes in men's behavior. And that means that gentlemen, us in the room, we do have to do the ironing or the washing up or take our fair share. There is no policy or institution out there that's going to make us do that. Or we're not going to get a solution to climate change unless we actually reduce our individual consumption, because that's the only way we'll reduce our carbon footprint and save the Earth's natural resources in the long term. There is not going to be a decline in inequality that I mentioned unless we learn to share more resources with each other. There is no meaningful democracy until we agree to work through our differences in a spirit of common purpose and actually talk to the enemy if we want to see it in those terms. There's never any lasting peace if we continue to project our fears and insecurities onto other people. That's the source of all violence and insecurity. So transforming those big systems in politics and economics and so on is at root a deeply personal project. But turning those examples around, which we should do, we also have to have real and living forms of politics and economics that grow from and reinforce the best qualities we want to encourage in ourselves and others and in which we can participate. We must be the change we want to see in the world is a favorite quotation. It comes from Mahatma Gandhi. But flipping it, it's equally true that we must be able to see the change we want to be. Otherwise, transformation is just a theory. Right? And that means that we have to show concretely in the here and the now that a different economy could indeed deliver 
justice and well-being, and that politics can indeed function in ways that break the logjam of vested interests. There's a great American philosopher called Josiah Royce, whose work you probably read, who wrote this in the aftermath of the Civil War. Only new selves can, can give birth to a new world, he said. Only new selves can give birth to a new world. But only a new world can sustain the new human beings that constitute it and must sustain it in turn. And that captures that reciprocal, cyclical um, pattern of personal and social change. And when you get both of those things working together, when you get mutually reinforcing cycles of change at these different levels, when you get new institutions and new people to animate them, then transformation becomes a genuine possibility. So that ends the sermon part of the talk, because that probably sounds very abstract to you, very broad blush. So what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes is to flesh out some of the details by telling you three brief stories that show what transformation means in practice in America today. Because transformation is already happening if we are open to seeing it. They all come from a new web magazine um, that I launched on, on July the 1st, which I hope you'll check out later. I'll give you the web address and so on. Uh, appropriately enough, it's called Transformation, so you can see I have a bit of a one-track mind at the moment. <laughs> but it is my current project. But please check it out later on. <clears throat> and the first story shows what is possible in the terms that I've been talking about, even in what you might think of as the hardest possible context or scenario, and that is the American justice system, or as some people call it, the American injustice system. This is a system with a national recidivism rate of 70%, a scandalous recidivism rate of 70%, dominated by a growing for-profit prison industry with a vested interest in imprisoning as many people as possible, because that's the way the bottom line keeps going up. It's an industry that's built on incarceration and punishment with very little heed to rehabilitation, and where one in every 10 young black males in the USA is currently residing in a prison. One in every 10. There are people, though, that are taking on that challenge in the way that I'm talking about, and I'm going to tell you a short story about one of them called Molly Rowan Leach. Molly's mother, in a psychiatric episode, slit the throat of a five-year-old girl about six years ago, and fortunately the girl survived, but um, you can imagine, actually you can't imagine a more horrific event than that. Whether you're the immediate victim, the victim's family, or frankly, the family of the person who committed the crime. So her mother has been in prison ever since. This is in the Midwest. And Molly has taken that as a motivation to do something about the uh, perception of what justice means in the United States. And she's launched a movement for what she calls restorative justice as opposed to retribution and vengeance and restorative justice simply means that we have to recognize that many many people are damaged by a crime including those who commit it obviously those who are on the receiving end and that the function of justice is to restore as much as possible all of those people to some sense of wholeness and balance rather than simply to punish and incarcerate people away and she tells this great story of a um, police officer, he's called Greg Ruprecht, and he works at a police department in a small town in the Rocky Mountains. He's a stellar performer in his profession, he's a former army captain, top of his class at the police academy, but he's something of a traditionalist. He believes, like many, that his job is to arrest people who commit a crime and basically throw away the key, because justice means punishment. You commit a crime, you get what you deserve. That's a fairly simple equation. And one night she tells the story of him turning up at a chemical plant in this small town and finding um, six boys between the ages of 10 and 13 who have broken in the gate. And so he arrests them, as he should do, takes them back to the police station and keeps them there ready for processing into that criminal justice system. And within six months, they would be in prison, probably. But he makes a different decision because his phone rings and just as he's about to leave his shift, and the call, she said, almost knocked him off his chair because he was told that this case was going to be redirected into a new process, an experiment called restorative justice. And he thinks, great, you know, an easy way out for offenders 
some sort of hippie gathering where everyone would hug, was his definition. But later that week, the process got started, and along with representatives from the boys' families, from the chemical plant, from the police, they got talking about what had happened and how to make things right. So they discussed accountability and how nothing would stay permanently on their records if the boys kept their word. So crucially, they would not become permanently considered as high risk in the criminal justice system. They would not go into that almost automatic funnel into an eventual prison mm -hmm. sentence. The boys got an opportunity to sit with the consequences of what they'd done, to discuss what had happened and who they had damaged in the process, to share anything from their own lives at home and so on that might have influenced their decision to break in. And what was interesting, she said, was that held in that sort of safe environment, if you want, that did not undercut the importance of accountability. Each boy was forced to listen to what the plant representatives had to say and began to understand that their acts had real human consequences. Apologies were made and the process gave the boys one clear message. Your actions are the problem, not you as human beings. Well, Ruprecht continues to feel a bit skeptical about that process, but he saw how much money was being saved by choosing to go down this route instead of jailing the boys, which is hugely expensive in the long term. He realized that this restorative process had more teeth than conventional punishment because it imposes real accountability face to face among offenders for their actions and it makes them listen directly to the victims of their crimes. They are in the room. He realized that six young lives might be saved from years of cycling in and out of the prison system. He learned that the human brain doesn't develop fully until the age of 22. So punishment and fear exciting regimes have an even bigger impact on the development of young people. He remembered his own kids and recognized that more than anything else, they and others deserve the chance to make mistakes and pick themselves back up again, sure in the knowledge of their own inherent worth and value. So he went with it. He went with the flow and hey presto, he took on other cases and he found that the usual suspects weren't recycling through the police department anymore. Recidivism in his area dropped to 10%. And surveys showed high rates of satisfaction with the process among everyone involved, whichever stakeholder you were. Now, this is two years later, Ruprecht is an official police ambassador for restorative justice. And he's one of the first of a growing number of law enforcement officials and corrections officers in prisons in the US who believe in transforming the sector in which they work. Just to conclude this story, the role of justice, Molly says, is to bring back balance, to make things right again. Punishment and the warehousing of human beings in prisons destroys vast amounts of human potential. By contrast, restorative justice meets the needs of everyone involved in the most humane ways possible, those who commit crimes and those who suffer from them. And it works in concrete terms by cutting recidivism and costs. Most important of all, it nurtures new relationships and a strong sense of human unity. In this sense, the root power of restorative justice is love expressed in action. That's how she finishes the story. It's a fantastic demonstration of what one human being can do faced by this seemingly impenetrable fortress of the prison industrial complex. I'm not claiming it's changing everything, but it's a transformative attempt. And that's why I'm raising it as an example. Let me go to example number two, completely different. This is a story from the domestic workers movement in California. And it's built around an undocumented El Salvadorian woman called Elizabeth Flores, um, who is a member of um, a, a civil society organization called the Alliance for um, Women in Northern California. And it starts at a press conference where she is talking about her experience as an undocumented immigrant domestic worker. Why is it acceptable, Elizabeth said, that dogs are treated with more dignity and respect than I am as an undocumented immigrant domestic worker in America? I earn $2.50 an hour for the work that I do. In comparison to the California minimum wage of $10 per hour and the accepted um, living wage of close to 11, so well below the poverty line in any conceivable sense. Despite our role in the economy, in caring for your families, domestic workers are employed in substandard jobs, work behind closed doors, beyond the reach of personnel policies, without employment contracts, 
and subject to the whims of our, employer, our, our employers. After the press conference, she and other domestic workers got on a bus and they went to the California State Capitol in Sacramento to meet the Governor Jerry Brown, who was about to sign what's called the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights, became law three weeks ago in California, that for the first time offers domestic workers protection in terms of wages and overtime and other benefits. So from September 26, 2013, that became law. What's interesting about this case is not really that, those details, but how domestic workers did it. Because they have invented what they consider a new way of combating injustice, and it's called transformative organizing. So what does that mean? Well, it's, it's organizing in your community, which does not aim simply to achieve a legal gain or pass a new policy or get more resources to an institution. Those things are important, but what they really want to do is to reorient relationships between workers, employers, and others on the basis of equality and respect, because that is the fundamental platform on which everything else has to be built. The domestic workers' movement believes that deeper shifts in society are more likely to be achieved if exploitation and abuse are addressed without demonizing those who are responsible, because that approach creates a much more positive atmosphere for change in which more people can buy in. And that's exactly what happened in California. You had workers, employers, unions, Republicans, Democrats, and so on, coming together around a common moral or ethical agenda, which supported the passage of that new law. How does that work in practice? Well, Elizabeth's response at the press conference that I mentioned that, from that quote provides the essential clue. Her smile and laughter filled the room with kindness, but the words she spoke gave voice to a deeply painful reality that must be confronted. American society continues to treat immigrant domestic workers so poorly because many of them are brown, because they are women, because they don't have the right papers, and because they do the work that other Americans don't want to do. But domestic workers care for our children, they clean our homes, they care for our grandparents and our family members who are ill, or have disabilities on a daily basis. So the organizing model that they are developing is seen as a labor of love. That's the title of this story. It's not just a campaign for better wages. It's not just born out of self-interest. It's a model that places equal emphasis on individual rights and collective liberation. So domestic workers in this movement are not concerned only for themselves. They're also concerned for their employers and for the future care and well-being of generations still to come. It's a very powerful, transformative vision. And Flores is living proof of what that means in practice. When I, this is the writer of the story speaking, when I first met her, I was working as an organizer myself. She was soft-spoken, almost timid. I asked her if she wanted to submit a claim for wages that one of her employers had stolen from her by doubling her hours of work without any extra payment, but she said she wasn't interested in harming him. He's an elderly man with multiple illnesses and many problems, she told me. I don't want to cause him any damage. I'm just here to look for work and make sure that this doesn't happen to me or any, anyone else again. I took her refusal to act as a sign that she was afraid. But over time, I learned that Flores had something much bigger in mind than punishing her employer. Like thousands of other domestic workers in the USA, she does want to change the way her work is valued and rewarded, but that's not enough. The ultimate goal is to transform the way we care for one another and to do so with love. That's the end of that story. So totally different context, but very similar message. We can leave a big gains in economic and terms and so on, but we can do it from a particular spirit which doesn't demonize others and which brings people together in common cause. And there was one wonderful comment just before I move on to the final story um, that was added to that story on the website by someone who said, I can hardly believe it, a successful social movement without rage or righteousness. And that to me, you know, I said, God bless you, whoever you are, you know, for that comment, because it captures completely what the story is trying to say. We can organize ourselves for social justice without rage or righteousness. And when you do, it works. So let's move on to the Pentagon. Uh, very different again, because as you probably know, I didn't know this until I read this story, the US government spends more on defense than the next 13 highest spending countries combined. Just think about that for a moment. Since the terrorist attacks on New York and Washington DC on September the 11th, 2001, 
The Pentagon's base budget has increased by 50% when adjusted for inflation, rising to half a trillion dollars for fiscal 2014. That does not include the cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That does not include those costs. If you did, you would add over $1 trillion more to that total. So we're already at a couple of trillion dollars. I mean, these numbers don't mean much when you get into the trillions, but you can see it's an awfully big, numbers, um, big number. And to make matters worse, the Pentagon has a history of cost overruns on weapon systems, many of which we know from the news are cancelled after billions of dollars have been spent on their development. Take, for example, Abrams M1 tanks. The US Army has repeatedly expressed its disinterest in more Abrams N1 tanks, but every, every year Congress adds back $3 billion to buy even more of them, which now sit in a desert parking lot in Nevada. A sort of definition of the kind of crazy gridlocked politics that I talked about earlier. Now, much of that waste reflects the staggering political clout, obviously, of defense contractors. But it's also true that our own fear and hysteria, I think, in the aftermath of, of those 9-11 attacks, totally understandable, has also been co-opted by defense power brokers to such an extent that unchecked spending on vaguely defined national security priorities has become synonymous with patriotism, and so it is something that is difficult to challenge. But a few years ago, and here's the heart of that transformative story, the US political climate began to shift. Because in 2010, you may remember, a new wave of fiscal conservative Tea Party representatives brought a strong libertarian voice to the House of Representatives. Are there any Tea Party members here, by the way? <laughs> Just checking. This is actually a positive story about the Tea Party, so you can own up if, if you're here. Um, and of course, they were calling for less government spending right across the board, even for the previously untouchable Pentagon. And that made a sort of weird common course on the liberal, progressive side, I guess you'd call it, because they also wanted to see an end to wars um, that were hugely, hugely costly um, and wanted to end foreign occupations and so on. And as that new political reality across the aisle came into focus, it created an opportunity to reshape the national debate on military spending. So in response to that, a whole range of groups, um, foundations and non-profits and so on, um, both liberal and conservative, launched a campaign to reformulate the issue of reduced Pentagon spending as what they call a transpartisan issue, which probably is, is an unfamiliar term to you, transpartisan. So here's what it means. Whereas bipartisan approaches, is what we're used to, I think, imply bargaining between two fixed positions to generate a sort of messy compromise somewhere in the middle, transpartisan campaigning or politics means working with those who you know have very different opinions right from the beginning in pursuit of long-range goals that you actually share. So it's actually a very different approach to, to bipartisanship. In this case, the long-range goal that they agreed was very simple. We want to achieve significant, sustained reductions in the top line of the Pentagon budget on a year-on-year -year basis. That was it. And that narrow goal was the only way to maintain the alliance. And that's very uncomfortable, I think, for many of its members because we all have slightly different views underneath in terms of how we would use the resources which are released in terms of social spending. For example, where Tea Party members and Liberals diverge completely. So they had to maintain their focus on that one goal. But by doing that, they were able to transform the conversation on budget issues, even in that hyper-partisan environment of Washington, D.C. Crucially, their campaign focused on building relationships among people rather than simply negotiating with fixed position-based institutions. And that's how it managed to create some progress, because you're dealing with human beings, basically. And what happened? Well, the campaign has helped to ensure that the Pentagon was not immune, as you remember from the recent sequestration process. Uh, the Pentagon budget was cut by 10% across the board in the Budget Control Act for 2011, something unheard of in recent years. And it looks as if there's going to be a similar 10% cut across the board in fiscal 2014 as a result of the continuation of this campaign and its discussions. So, small, but 10% of, of trillions of dollars is actually quite a large amount of money when you think about it, so not insignificant. And it shows the debate is shifting. The campaign is beginning to realign traditional relationships and alliances in order to rein in the Pentagon's want and spending. The challenge, of course, is to, to sustain and deepen these new alignments 
and permanently bend the cost curve of the biggest military spending machine in history. So there's three very different um, contexts where, as I'm trying to show, a different way of approaching the problem produces really good results as a result of recognizing the fundamentally human dimension of what we're trying to do. So in the two or three minutes that remains, what can we learn from those stories? And there are many, many others. Well, returning to my definition of transformation, I think you can see that they all illustrate two things. The first is that people, the people involved did not just to try to, to tweak or modify the systems they were trying to change. They actually tried to replace them with something else whether it was restorative justice instead of retribution or social activism that didn't demonize another group as the enemy or political alliances in the form of the Pentagon budget campaign that sought out common ground across huge ideological differences. So that's that boundary breaking, sort of liberating part of the definition that I talked about. We're not just interested in tweaks here and there. We want to actually change the system in fairly radical ways. The second lesson is that integrating personal and social change really does make a difference in all of those stories. They're not just tales about new ways of doing things in society, in other words. They're also stories about people, individuals, who are brave enough to live out their values in the work that they do as a way of anchoring new policies and institutions in their personal behaviour and commitments. That's that combination of internal and external change whether that personal behaviour consists of ceding ground to others in order to cement a coalition, for example, Tea Party members, or accepting that you or I share the responsibility for keeping six kids out of prison if they break into our home, or if we employ a domestic worker and we're faced with the choice of whether to pay the minimum wage or not. Those are simultaneously deeply personal and political questions. And I do think that marrying a rich inner life dedicated to the cultivation of loving kindness and compassion with the practice of these new forms of politics and economics and social activism is the pathway to transformation. And we can all get involved in this spirit to make bigger things happen. So transformation is an attitude of mind. It's not a matter of scale or size or wealth. You don't have to be powerful or wealthy to be a transformer, to be an agent of transformation. It's like dropping pebbles in a pond. Our own small actions can create lots of larger and more powerful ripples as the process of transformation goes outwards through the justice system, for example, in Molly's case, or with Elizabeth Flores, in terms of how domestic workers are organised and treated. But we have to change the way we think if we're going to act in that way, because we're not used to it. It's challenging, it's difficult, it's, it's new. Um, but we can all do it, as those examples show. So transformation is already happening in the here and the now as the stories I've related demonstrate. And there are hundreds more of them that are on the website. That's my second and final advert for the magazine that I edit. You can find it on the web, and I'll leave this address behind. If you type in www.opendemocracy.net backslash transformation. And we're just about to start, actually, a very interesting series on the transformation of politics in the United States, starting with a very interesting article by a leading conservative thinker, actually, called Jacob Hess, called Beyond Angels and Demons, the Future of American Politics, just to give you a flavour of what that's about, Beyond Angels and Demons. So check it out, please, and, um, and, and enjoy surfing. I hope I've at least whetted your appetite uh, to explore this exciting movement and to develop a more transformative attitude to your own role in the world. Probably you already have it, starting here in Scranton, of course, where there's a lot of transformation that needs to be uh, done, starting with the fiscal situation, from what I've heard and then going far, far beyond in terms of politics and economics and activism and education and healthcare and families and everything else that we can think of. There is, I think, a deeply transformative future awaiting us if we are brave enough to grasp it, but we have to be willing to move in that direction. We can help, I think, to construct, to build, to bring about that beloved community that Martin Luther King dreamed of in the 1960s. So good luck and thanks for listening. Michael, I trust you will accept some questions. Absolutely, yes. I belong to a group here at the university that's university related called the Woodstock Group that 
tradition. Do you know that? It started in Georgetown and it's, it's spreading out around the country. And one of the issues that they talked about recently was the uh, situation with a place like Walmart where the social justice appears not to exist in any great uh, degree. Right. And I won't go all through that because that's my history of what I've been doing. But I was quite surprised the other day when I seldom watch the commercials on television, but I just bumped into a Walmart commercial the other day. Mm -hmm. And it looks as if they are actually, unless they're just saying they're doing this, but they, it looks like they're actually trying to improve the, the lives of people who work as employees there. Do you, are you aware of any of that? Or is that for real, or do you think that's just mm -hmm. a, a on a television screen. Well, it's very difficult to, to, to know, to be honest. I think Walmart is a classic example of giving with one hand and taking with the other. In some aspects of their performance, you're absolutely right. So, um, you know, if you want to buy energy saving, saving light bulbs, you can buy them now at Walmart. That's a great contribution to energy saving and therefore controlling climate emissions because they're a huge retailer of light bulbs. So we have to celebrate that. But they wouldn't be doing that unless they made money, uh, you know, from doing it. So that's. It's a good decision, but it's a business decision. At the same time, they remain, as you know, extremely reluctant to host any discussions on organizing the workforce, improving benefits um, in terms of time off, um, sick leave, health care, uh, and so on. And that's a bad thing. Um, and so Walmart is constantly juggling the bad things and the good things, you know? And every time you take one step forward, there seems to be one step backward somewhere else in the company. And they would say, um, I'm not directly involved with them, but I'm sure they would say, they're doing what they can to remain competitive and to be socially responsible in that environment. But you can't expect us as Walmart to turn ourselves into a social service agency. Right? That's not what we are. But I had, it had a different tone from other ads that I've seen. I haven't seen Walmart ads, but mm -hmm. other ads that you see every day on television or any other place on the radio. And they really, they had this, well, it could be a PR thing, but they, they actually, it, it raised my um, hopes that maybe there would be some change there. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I think, you know, and, and good for you for doing this work, I think that the, the, the right way, maybe that's the right, I won't say the right, the way I would approach this is to keep going and keep, keep the pressure on almost regardless because then whether they do or they don't, you know, whether they're duplicious or not, whether it's PR or real, you're still, you're still making progress and the more progress you make, the closer you'll get to something which is genuine. Um, and I, I think, you know, with Walmart, um, the real issue is cost, from what I understand, because their entire business model is based on reducing costs to the maximum degree. But when you reduce costs to the maximum degree, there's a human element right there, because that means reducing salaries, healthcare benefits, squeezing suppliers, and their distribution chains and their supply chains. And that, I think, is, the, is going to be the key in the future. It's not really what they sell um, or even, you know, whether they'll have a union or not. I mean, that probably would be a major, you know, be a big PR thing if they did and so on. But so what, if, even if you have a union, if you continue to squeeze everyone in a vice to the maximum possible degree, you'll still um, be committing all sorts of, uh, or causing all sorts of problems in human terms. So I think, um, and this links back to the transformative issue, if we, if we can think more expansively about what a transformed economy would look like, where you take that, that pressure off the company, in the long term, that's the only way that you would solve the problem that you're talking about. In other words, if companies, and it may sound weird, but it's already out there in B corporations as they're called and others, if companies no longer had to make a profit, then you would be starting to talk about transforming the economy. They could still make a surplus of income over expenses, but you distribute it in a radically different way, and you didn't always aim to maximize it. There are plenty of companies out there now which are not maximizing their profits deliberately because they see themselves in that situation, but they're still successful. But how successful do you want to be? As we saw in the inequality, do you want 100% of the benefits or will you make do with 80% of the benefits and give the rest, give the 20% back? That's the Walmart question in stark terms. So if we're going to transform the economy, we have to get into that central mechanism of how it, the economy operates, which is around private profit and how it's used. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, you mentioned how do we think about what a transformative economy would look like. Um, so I work here at the university, and of course, higher ed is going through enormous changes right now. Right. And I think we know.
know we need to transform. We know that we need to do things differently. But I think we're struggling with that first step of envisioning what the transformed uh, world of higher ed would look like. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for us? And how do we start that process? And do we <laughs> That's a fantastic yeah. question. <laughs> Figure that out. No, that's a fantastic question. You put me on the spot. Um, of course, it's difficult because we're, that, that's a real question in a real institution here, where we are. And so the, that's where the rubber hit the road, right? We're not talking about Walmart. We're talking about this university. Well, you know, everyone knows that higher education is under enormous financial, fiscal pressure, and therefore is changing its business model to become more profit-seeking. And that has human consequences, going back to the session we've just had. Um, and we can't be, um, you know, Pollyannish about that. We have to accept that that is a financial reality that has to be dealt with. Money has to be earned. Students have to be charged. Research grants have to be brought in from industry, and all the other things that you need to make an institution viable. Um, but one of the trade-offs in doing that, in terms of the overarching, presumably social and spiritual mission of the university, particularly this one, spiritual mission of the university. Um, to say that there are no trade-offs is clearly stupid. There are always trade-offs in every decision in life. So the key is to um, um, surface them, debate them, see how you can approach them in different ways, in the most useful way, and then make your decisions, rather than rushing into distance-based learning or maximizing you know, revenue from a new course, which doesn't, doesn't really contribute very much, but it's you know, attractive in the marketplace. Uh, or, or making everyone adjunct faculty to reduce your core faculty costs. You know, the usual schemes and scams, or call them. <laughs> but university administrators, and administrators indulge them, quite rightly, as managers, to balance the books. The bigger issue, of course, is, is you know, what does it cost, and how would you finance the social mission of the university going forward, if you believe that there is a social mission? If you don't, you don't have a problem. You're just another corporation. You're just a, a higher education corporation like Walmart. But if you continue to believe, you know, somewhat old-fashioned, maybe romantic, but that's, that's, that's who we are, maybe in the room, you know, you would want to um, put that up as the highest priority and everything else is negotiable, rather than flipping it and saying that's negotiable because the priority is profit. And I think, you know, to, to, to force yourself to do that is, is the way to do it, to say our highest priority is to increase build out our social mission, whatever that means. You know, it means this, 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 and this. Now how are we going to do it? And how are we going to pay for it? And, and what are the trade-offs involved? And let's make some decisions on that. If you do that in a conscious, deliberate, probably slow you know, process, you'll be successful. Um, because there's no law that says you can't be both socially and, and financially successful as a university going forward in Scranton. I mean, that, that, that would be ridiculous. Um, but I think the trends are driving universities away from that social mission, um, in my view, unnecessarily. Um, I mean, tell us a little bit about what's actually happening here, which presumably lies behind your question. Are you worried about what's happening, or not worried, or do you see this a place as a model, perhaps, or not a model? I think. Yeah, you can put it together. Um, <laughs> no, I think I think we have so many strengths, and I, I, I'm inspired by. Well, you've identified that you know the crucial management issue, which is people do get lost in the details, becomes an end in itself to try and move the pieces around on the jigsaw, rather than saying you know what's happening up here, and you don't want to you know you don't want to get lost in the clouds. That's the reverse problem, just as bad. But if all you're doing is moving the pieces on the on the chessboard or the deck players on the Titanic, as someone once said to me. You know, the boat is still sinking, uh, while the band's, band's playing, you know, but the deck chairs look nice. Um, there's a little bit of that in, 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 large, in most large institutions of this kind, because it's very difficult to simultaneously keep your eyes on the prize and be a very effective sort of middle senior manager. But that's the art of good management, I think, is to be able to do that. During the period 
beginning in the late 40s and ending in the 70s, mm -hmm. we not only witnessed uh, expansion of the middle class, we witnessed opportunities in education. Yeah. Uh, I'm not just talking about affordability at the college level, I'm talking about uh, real teaching taking place in more than just elite suburban schools, but in city schools as well. And right now, that's been decimated across the land. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's probably less learning taking place in, in America right now than there is chaos in classrooms from coast to coast. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you get from there to any kind of transformation? I should have been here for your last talk. That would have been more appropriate for me. Quite the pessimistic. Yeah. How do we get there? Well, it, well it, you know, everything starts with someone thinking and doing something. Um, so how you get there is having one person, a teacher or not, or whoever, you know, um, having some sort of spark, some sort of transformational intent, like Molly Rowe Leach when her mother was in prison. Um, or the uh, couple of domestic workers who came together in California, or whatever, you know, without that, nothing's going to happen. And that's why the previous talk, perhaps, was, was important because it was talking about the decline of that spark in grassroots communities and the feeling that it's no longer possible, as you say, to really make much of a difference, uh, whoever I am, actually, but particularly in those very um, resource poor, somewhat chaotic environments. You know, the whole education reform and transformation debate has become so polarized it's very difficult to make any sense of it in the transformational way you know and i almost think um i, I tried actually to commission someone called diane rabbit if that name rings a bell she was um secretary of education in, under reagan i think ronald reagan but she then um wrote a book which um was the complete opposite of what she'd been thinking and doing in politics which was to say that there's no easy you know um, market-based formula for rescuing our schools. We have just to get serious about um, building communities in schools and around schools, um, and gradually that will change the process, um, improve quality, but there's no magic bullet in the words, whether it's testing or charter schools or you know, any of the other things that are on offer at the moment. Um, so I wanted, her, I wanted to commission her not to write about the details of the policy agenda, but to write about how you would approach the whole debate from a transformation perspective. In other words, how do you get Bill Gates and uh, the Walton Foundation and the Broad Foundation and Teach for America and people who tend to be very um, market and business oriented um, in their approach to school reform, on the one hand, and teachers' unions and academics uh, who tend to be on the other side. Uh, and at the moment, it's a bit, you know, that old African proverb, uh, when the elephants fight, the grass suffers. It's a bit like that. You have two elephants fighting, and the grass in the middle, kids in schools, are suffering, because the battle is not really about improving education at all. It's about who controls the education reform debate. Um, but why are we doing that? It doesn't make any sense at all. So I think what these examples show, if you don't depend to get the same thing, you can actually develop some common ground um, among people of radically different ideological backgrounds and intents if you spend enough time on the, on the process of bringing people together, working through human relationships, identifying values, and so on. You may actually find um, you know, that there's more common ground than you think, but you have to do, go through that process. And if you're simply you know, throwing rocks at each other from great distance, it's not gonna happen. So um, we know that there are examples of transformation um, across America in lots of places and lots of institutions. I don't have many in schools, and that's an interesting observation that I'm sure they're there, but I just don't know about them. But I don't think the way we're doing it at the moment will get us anywhere near where we need to go, and it's the problem that we have, that people are simply fighting over turf and political power, uh, and we've forgotten, so we're going back to this question, forgotten the vision, the big picture of what we're trying to do here, which as you say, is to promote real deep democratic learning in schools. Well, I have an idea. But you, you use the word radical, and my idea is simply this. Open schools at 6 o'clock in the morning, that's not an absolute time, mm -hmm. so that parents that are single parents can drop their kids off. If they want to shoot a basketball, allow them to shoot a basketball. If they want to meet with a mathematics tutor, they meet with a mathematics tutor. And keep them, this is very radical, keep them in the school as long as the parent is willing to allow them to stay, because the families are destroyed that's a huge problem for America. And we'll never get to transformational ideas as 
we won't have enough thinkers, or we won't have enough people that are willing to yeah, transform. That's, that's a crucial question. You know, the erosion of, of genuine learning um, shoots a hole through my entire thesis. You're right. If we don't have enough of those people creating sparks, then we're in deep, deep trouble because there's no no even prospect. I don't know about that idea. We'll have to throw it open to the group and see what support you get. Whether they would vote that in or vote it out, I have no idea. But it's a great idea. Thanks. On the level of individual people, persons, I think you would agree that once a person has lost all hope, what is left there is probably cynicism. And yet, each of us deals with people who think of themselves as realists when really they're just cynics. So how this acts out, if you have a reason for hope, and you talk to people about it, whether it be a policy or a program or whatever, they'll want to nitpick at it, uh, offering details, which they say, well, that's a part of the story. And they lose the big picture. So it doesn't help on the level of people who aren't religious people, uh, I'd say that's not reality. Uh, with religious people, I've had some success saying to them outright, you're being a cynic because they don't want to be called a cynic. I think religious people like to believe they have hope. So, so when, we're, when we're talking with people who have lost all hope. And they're nitpicking. They're giving you really the exception to the rule. They don't want to look at the rule. Now this may be down a little bit from the systems and that you usually deal with. But, but do you have any advice on that level? Well, that's a great question. You have to be very practical. You're right. I mean, I think well, one, one thing is simply sometimes to know when, when, when to walk away. I've been, I've been in plenty of conversations which go on and on in that way because I'm trying to stay in there because <laughs> uh, I want something to happen. Um, but everyone is free to say, you know, okay, let's meet again in five years' time <laughs> and we'll talk again or whatever. Because if, if there isn't, if there isn't a, you know, a, a very basis of, of motivation to go somewhere, then obviously people aren't going to go and you're, and you're probably wasting your time. It sounds a bit defeatist, but I've uh, maybe the older I get, then maybe, maybe I'm becoming cynical. I don't think I am, but I just, I just feel sometimes I now know when, when to leave the room uh, and say, "Fantastic, great meeting you. you know, see you again." I think there are two other elements of a better answer. Look, one is, you know, I remember uh, the, the example of the Pentagon budget campaign when I said that they only held it together because they stayed at the big picture level, the vision level, where they had fun ground. They deliberately did not get into any nitpicking, any, any. Um, detailed policy debates because they knew that would um, throw the whole thing yeah. into the bin. And of course that's a weakness as well as a strength because you may well um, reduce Pentagon spending by 20% over two years. <coughs> that's a good thing, but then what? Um, but the Tea Party representatives and um, you know some, some of the non-profits were never going to agree on how to spend the funds that have been released from those savings. Uh, because they're diametrically opposed in terms of social spending. Uh, so leave it aside. You know, do what you can, um, and then find another alliance and do those other things. So that's the first part of the answer. The second, going back to your religious spiritual, is that you know a lot of people who are involved in this sort of transformational work I've noticed may not call themselves overtly religious or spiritual, but that's partly because those words have a certain uh, they they they. Um, Call for a certain response, at least in the United States, I've noticed, more so than in other countries, um, because of the whole separation of church and state and the profile of organized religion and so on. Um, it's sort of a bit of a no go territory. But people are convinced that there is an inner, there's a rich inner life that's accessible to us all, which is a resource for us. And if we can access it as a resource, then that makes it more effective in um, developing this sort of work. So, for example, there's a big mindfulness movement. Mindfulness simply meaning being able to focus your mind clearly uh, rather than you know, going all over the place because that's a very good basis for having a better discussion. You know, everything is, if everything is chaos in here, it's probably going to be fairly disorganized out there and vice versa. 
if there's some sense of centering and focus and calmness and integrity and self-development and self-awareness inside, you're probably going to be a much better co-worker or co-creator in your political activities and, and so on. So there is a link here, you know, with whatever you call it, spirituality, religious experience. Are you saying such people seem to have a reason to hope? Well, yes, but not just that. I think the reason for hope comes from lots of things, including physical security, material security, uh, being surrounded by family and a community who supports you. Um, but that's, that's not a substitute for developing the kind of inner resources that I'm talking about, which seem to make a big difference in the examples that I'm using. Um, on the other hand, I've had very good discussions with people I respect who say that's crazy, you're just being an evangelical, you're just trying to proselytize, you're converting people and so on. All that new age, mindfulness, meditation, you know, stuff is, is no part of this conversation. If it is, I don't want to be part of it because that takes it in a totally different direction. I can be a loving and compassionate person. I can be a transformative agent without any of that stuff, right? No. But then you sort of ask them, well, do you go for walks in nature? Or, you know, do you read novels? Do you do anything which takes you out of the words of the day-to-day -day external world and focus yourself inwards? Oh yeah, so, and how do you feel when you go for nature or I feel really great. And what sort of position does it put you in? Well, I'm really calm when I come back and have to get on the phone with my colleagues. So, you know, that, that reality never goes away. You know, that, that sense of finding out more about who we are on the inside um, and using that as a resource for our work on the outside doesn't go away just because you're not religious or you don't believe in spirituality. It's there somewhere, somehow, in some shape or form. Um, and maybe you can access it in a totally secular way, in which case, fine. But it has to be there, I think. Michael, Michael I'm, I'm looking at the screen that says World Affairs Lunch and Transformation. So my question to you is, with your advocacy and hope, does it extend beyond the United States to such places as South America, Africa, and Muslim world? Yes, it does. I, actually, I think the most difficult is not within countries, but between countries. You know, if, if we were to try to transform international relations, that would be almost the ultimate victory, um, because then you're dealing not just with complications within a, a, a cultural setting, but power plays and complications between them, and that's where I think things really get difficult. You know, so can we really transform the international nuclear weapons environment? Take a current example which otherwise will blow us all up at some point. Um, very difficult because there, you know, there is a very traditional zero-sum approach to who has power in the international community and who therefore should have weapons, who doesn't, and how you deal with them and so on. So I think there are examples of, of transformative work everywhere and we have them on the side. I don't think it's culturally banned. I don't think that there are more of them here than there. I'm just more familiar with certain parts of the world than others. Um, but we had a wonderful article two weeks ago um, uh, it was called um, Flash Mob, Flash Mob Iftars in the Ramadan Tent, Transformation in Islamic Communities in the East End of London. Bit of a mouthful, but it's a fantastic article if you go to the site to read it. Written by this sparky young Muslim woman in London who is both a writer and, and an activist, documenting all these tiny little transformative things that are happening in London's young Muslim scene from this perspective that you know, I have absolutely no idea about. But, but they are done with, a, with an Islamic, a very particular Islamic perspective based on the Quran. So I, you know, whether it's Islamic or Catholic or South American or North American, I'm not sure that makes much of a difference, even though you know, context is always important. But I think you know, the, 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 more you, um, the higher the scale, the more different actors involved, the more difficult it's going to get because at that big international relations level, security level, people tend to go backwards into their shells and defend you know, their narrow interests and they're not interested in transformation at all. So I think that's the real issue. There was one question here and then Sondra. My question goes back to your third example. Okay. Would you disagree if I, if I said that the common ground that the Tea Party and, and, and the liberals found mm -hmm. was essentially not common ground at all because none of them believed in that outcome. They just figured that this either would never come to, or if it did, they would be able to unbundle and, and get out their uh, pet projects. 
I think I would disagree, but then I wasn't in the campaign, so I can't give you a proper answer to that question. I mean, you may be right, may well be right. I mean, they think they found common ground in relation to uh, the, the very specific definition I gave of the goal of the campaign, simply reducing the top line of the Pentagon budget on a year-by-year -year basis. That's it. No, That's our common ground. Yeah. Yeah, across the board. Is that is that deep common ground? No, as we've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. Is it important common ground? I think so. Yeah. I think if you could shave off a trillion dollars from American military spending and spending on something more useful, I would go for that. So I think that would be worth a couple of meetings. <laughs> Thanks. But, okay. Oh, yes, I I was wondering if there is you see any kind of a movement about restore restorative justice because uh, your example brought to my mind a couple of things. One was um, I've heard um, stories on TV, issues in Spanish or wherever, <coughs> about judges who are dealing with veterans in ways that deal more in restorative justice than in this mm -hmm. And so I wondered if, um, since I've heard a few of those, I just wonder if that's something that could catch on in some way, easier ways than some of the other issues. Well, you would hope so. It's, it's, it's actually a very powerful emotional concept, I think, first of all. Who wouldn't want to restore human beings to a sense of yeah. humanity, wholeness, and reduce cost and recidivism at the same yeah, time? Right. <laughs> it's, like the, it's like the perfect have, combination. It works. A lot of these things have practical... Uh, yeah. One that comes to my mind is, you know, I've been doing a lot of work in um, Rwanda, and the gachacha courts there mm -hmm. uh, seem to me the most proactive and effective approach to truth and reconciliation that I know of in the world. Yeah, it's a great example. The South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission is another. Yeah. So it is spreading, but we can't, we can't possibly we claim that it's the mainstream. Yeah. It hasn't reached Sullivan County, where I live, for example, <laughs> where the chair, my wife is the chair of the, of the um, Public Safety Committee. Well, She's a legislator. <laughs> so she tours the jails all the time. And believe me, this is like going back to Dickensian. If there's an equivalent of Dickensian, prison conditions right here and there. So, so we haven't got it, but it is spreading, but small, small. We, we did a story last week about Antoinette Tuff. Does that name ring a bell? She was the school accountant in Georgia, elementary school in Georgia, who went in an armed intruder, a young man, um, who was clearly intent on shooting. Large numbers of kids entered the school. She confronted him, and rather than um, simply throwing herself at him or, you know, um, turning and running, or, or which is probably what I would have done. She went up to him and said, I love you. And it completely disarmed him. This is a true story. I love you. I know exactly how you're feeling. Talk to me about it. And simply yeah. talked him down. And he lay down on the counter, you know, gave up all his weapons. This was before the police arrived. Um, and so we wrote up that story because it's an incredibly powerful, again, a personal political story of what we're talking about. And who would have thought that you could do that with those simple words? Um, but they're three very powerful words. So that's a sort of restorative justice argument too. Yes, here's a kid who is in serious trouble yeah. and he may well blow, you know, uh, kill a lot of people. We have to stop him. Yeah. That's one side of the conversation. How are we going to do that? Armed security, fences, you know, guards, guns, and so on. That's one side. Or I, we could simply say, I'm not saying these are, this is either or, don't get me wrong. But in this case, that simple act of recognizing the humanity in someone else and saying, I'm with you, you know, I'm there for you. There's no need to have the gun. Just put it down and we can work it out. Saved however many lives we don't know. But a tremendously important one. So I think you're right that there's something about that, whereas, whereas transforming the economy is much more difficult. I think that, that is, you know. Um, you can't just say, I love you. <laughs> well, we could. I'm not sure how far it would get us. You know, with Walmart, we could say it. And they start selling loads with I love you on you. Know, so it's like ridiculous prices. Yeah. Well, Michael, thank you so much sure. for giving us uh
giving us hope and ideas and uh, inspiration. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you again. And uh, don't forget, next week we've got um, the uh, Taiwan, uh, the uh, the person talking about Taiwan and its special role in the world on the 13th, and Father Quinn on the 14th. So we'll see you next week. Thank you.